Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the Hatchie River Conservancy. Thanks, Zach. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we can explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your guest host today, Claire Somm. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's guest, what's something that you've discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week, I discovered the Native American cradle board from the Lakota Nation that we have in our Enlightenment Gallery. It was used to hold an infant. They could be attached to the mother's back or a horse's saddle during travel or propped up against a tree while the mother was working. You might be able to use this down the road, Claire. That's, um, that's certainly special. Um, that's something I did not know. Uh, for those who are listening at home, I'm expecting my second child, and it is a little girl. So um, how exciting. Um, to, to know that fun fact. Our guest today is Kirsten Blanchard, a social media influencer from Kentucky who has successfully built a vibrant online lifestyle brand focused on affordable fashion with over 50,000 followers on TikTok and Instagram. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Claire Somm. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Discovery Park, and I am so excited to have Kirsten Blanchard here with us as our guest on Real Foot Forward and our guest at AAF West Tennessee meeting. So we're going to get started with our first question here. Kirsten, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what inspired you to become an influencer? Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, Well, my background, so I'm originally from Paris, Kentucky, which if you say that around here, people assume Tennessee. Um, And I'm actually a licensed hairstylist. So I did that for um, eight or nine years. And around 2020, um, you know, the world shut down and the salons were shut down and my husband also got a new job. So he was gonna have to be traveling a lot for work at that time. Um, At that time, it was potentially up to like four to six months. We have two small kids at that time, they were five and one and that seemed like a huge, huge change. Um, So anyways, we had kind of talked about that and we couldn't, I couldn't work in the salon and whenever the salons opened back up, Um, opened back up we decided that um, I was just gonna go with him so we went with him it actually ended up being um, more about four weeks um, and which was nice compared to or I'm sorry yes four weeks compared to four months Um, and during that time is when I kind of started all of this Um, but yeah I am a licensed hairstylist first Um, I just have been out from behind the chair since then And as far as what inspired me to be an influencer, that kind of just happened, Um, luckily. This all was more of a creative outlet for me at the time that COVID was going on and I had a one-year-old and the world was shut down and we were making all these big life changes. I had severe postpartum depression as well. And so it really started as an outlet for me to just have something to be creative with because I'm just a creative soul and that's how I get my emotions out. So it started for myself at first and I thought, cool, if like one person reads it, it was originally a blog, like a written blog, that would be neat, but it was more just to have something to focus my mind on and then people liked it and then it just kind of went from there. So that was just uh, lucky, I guess. I think there was a lot of hard work involved in it too as well. So specifically, how did you get started? What was your, and and maybe share a little bit about what your first break was, but we kind of got the background of of why you got started, but um, let's kind of go into how and how it all happened. Okay. So when he was traveling for work, we were in Kansas. And like I said, it ended up only being about four weeks. But while we were there, I started writing um, my written blog and I didn't put it out to the world yet. But it was more focused on like mental health. I have anxiety also, yay, uh, don't we all to a certain extent? And can you tell? Because I'm shaking like a leaf up here. Um, <laughs> I'm shaking in my metaphorical boots. Um, but anyways, so it started as that and then kind of just everything that I liked at that time. I didn't really have a niche. It was like crafts with my kids and mental health and fashion and all the things because, again, it was originally just for me Uh, and then I put that out um, like my first blog post I think probably a few months after I wrote it and then I applied for like to know it and kind of went from there Um, as far as like social media I've kind of used it always um, but using it for this started after that Um, first big break is that what you said 
Sorry, I forgot the question. Uh, <laughs> my anxiety. Um, probably working with Dillard's, which was really exciting. Um, so they had an initiative at that time um, that I guess like corporate Dillard's had told all their smaller stores like, hey, you guys should start working with influencers. Like this is where it's at. They're closer to your target audience. Um, get some influencers to help you when you have these brand deals to push. And originally they had reached out to another influencer in our era who is like much bigger than me even still. And I think she just didn't see their message. And luckily for me, I'm like the only other one in our area at, at that time. And at, I only had about, I think like 5,000 followers then. And so they reached out to me and said, like we tried to get in contact with this other person, but she's not answering. And so would you be interested? And because of who I am as a person, I was like overly honest. And I was like, um, yeah, but I've never really done this. And I can tell you all my analytics of like where my followers are, what they respond to, but like it might flop. I don't know, I've never done it before. And she said, I appreciate your honesty, let's do it, you know? So I got to come in and take pictures with like their launch they were doing and they put it out and they had like a sales goal for the first week and they hit it, they surpassed it in the first day after they posted my stuff. And uh, she was like, she was adamant that it was because of me. And I was like, me, oh my gosh. But it was really cool because she believed in me when I didn't even necessarily believe in myself. And then also it was kind of a full circle moment for me because when I was growing up, my mom worked in McGalpin's, which is what is now Dillard's. So that was kind of neat too. Um, and it gave me more confidence to kind of just like, hey, maybe I am halfway decent at this, you know? Like she thought I was, and then it worked. And I was like, heck, okay, let's do it. What do we have to lose? That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I was gonna ask a different question, but since we're on the brands topic, let's go, and you can use Dillard's as an example, but okay. maybe some other brands. Uh, what is that like? How, how does, from start to finish, how does it go working with a brand? Um, what, you know, I'm sure by now, because you have a large following, so you probably have some of your own guidelines that you, that you, and, that you choose to work with or not work with for brands. So, um, What's your favorite thing about them and, and how, just the overall process? Okay, of working with brands. It kind of depends, honestly, um, company to company. Like with that, I was speaking with the dealer saying I was speaking with the um, manager in our local store. So that was a little easier because it was literally just a DM that turned into a text message. Yes, sorry, Paducah. Um, with other ones, a lot of times it's emails. Um, you can actually, there's many sites you can get on and apply for brand deals. Um, a lot of them you have to pitch yourself to. Like if there's someone you want to work with, you got to send them a pitch and tell them that you exist, number one, and why they want to know that you exist because there's just so many people. They don't necessarily see you. Um, I do have a media kit and then um, like a rate card. And so that's something that the media kit just basically goes over all your um, analytics, your audience and all that. So they kind of know more about you, more about your audience, what your demographics like, all that. And I send that. And then if they're interested, there's a rate card that kind of breaks down um, the pricing. Sometimes it's more of a negotiation. You know, they come to you and say, this is what we have. And you say, yay or nay, or can we do this? And then um, there's a lot of people that want to do gift exchange too. So it kind of just depends from brand to brand. I don't do a ton of brand deals because I'm, once I started kind of branching into that, I was really particular about like, I wanna be trustworthy first and foremost. And it feels really salesy and untrustworthy to me personally and to each their own to just constantly be doing that. And <clears throat> my people now know what I like and what I don't like. So it would feel really disingenuous if I was just talking about all kinds of stuff all the time and wouldn't do well for me or the brand. So I'm kind of picky. Um, I really only do very minimal brand deals. And if I do, it's something that I already use or a business that I already like or something that I'm just genuinely interested in. And if it's something I'm interested in and I haven't used before, I will let them know, like, I haven't used it, so I'm willing to do this. But if I don't like it, I'm not willing to, to say that I do, you know, which sometimes they don't like that. And that's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just kind of go with honesty as far as that's concerned, which hasn't filled me yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just kind of depends business to business, I guess, how they go about doing that. Um, 
this was not actually on my original question list, but since we're here, I'm going to ask. TikTok shop is what, maybe a year old, if that. Um, how has the world of TikTok shop changed you specifically and what's your overall thoughts about it? Okay, I have multiple thoughts about TikTok I'm shop. Sorry if I sprung you on that question. No, you're fine. <laughs> Did I turn that off? No, nope. Okay. Hold the, sorry, hold it up here. Sorry. Um, TikTok shop, I feel like it has positives and negatives. Negatives being that when you get on there, that's pretty much all we see now because that's what their algorithm's pushing and you get on there and it's like, hey, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, buy this, which is annoying to literally anyone. Like we all can agree, right? Um, but I think that if you have built a community again, based on like trust and you're only sharing the things that you really care about or that have something to do with what you're trying to provide for your audience, then it doesn't seem disingenuine because they know you and they know your intentions. And as a creator, it's awesome if you're using it properly. Um, I actually did not branch into TikTok shop until April, so just a few months, because honestly, I thought it was spammy, and I wasn't finding anything on there that I was like, ooh, I have to have that, or that looked like it wasn't, that looked like it was good quality, which maybe is rude to say, but just to be honest. Um, and I finally bought a hat, and, um, I just happened to make a video. We were actually going on a date night and I just made a video to show my outfit and I realized it was backwards. So when we were in the car about to walk through, like into the restaurant, I told my husband, I was like, wait a second, I'm just gonna take a video in the car real quick and show this hat because it was reading backwards in the video before. It was like right over a minute long and I didn't edit it or do anything to it. I just made it right in TikTok, put that hat on it on TikTok shop, first one ever, and it went wild like people went crazy over that video and um, I mean it, it ch changed my TikTok shop in that video changed my monetary status as far as TikTok's concerned like tremendously so I do think that it can be super beneficial if done the right way just a follow-up question so you're saying that you get a certain commission rate off of your yeah. sales of is it a standard rate or is it depend on product? So it depends on the brand. They all do different ones. And it'll typically tell you on there, like if you're in the creator program and you're looking at the TikTok shop, it'll say this product costs $30. Your expected commission is $3 per thing or whatever. Um, most of them I feel like are around 10% or lower. But then they occasionally um, run... Uh, like a promotion and they'll increase your percentage that you get so that hat actually when I um, originally shared it was at 10 percent and then it was going viral and like two weeks later they upped it to like three times that amount so I shared it again and then that one went too so you kind of got to watch but it'll tell you um, what the percentage is and what you can get off of it mm -hmm. Awesome. I personally have a USA t-shirt from TikTok shop waiting at my mailbox at home today, actually. So I, I'm a fan of TikTok shop, I, I, but I'm like you at first. I thought it was scammy. I, I wasn't sure about it, but it's, it's quick shipping for most. I, I'm sure that depends on, maybe I should have asked that, but everything I've ordered has been quick shipping. Yeah. Um, so uh, move on. We're going to move on a little bit um, out of that topic. Um, what is the most rewarding experience that you've had to date? I, wanna, I know we talked about your big break. Is there something that has happened, but that's been about four years ago when you worked with Dillard. So um, what, what's something that's happened since then? Um, you're, you're over 20,000 followers now. You're over 25,000 on Instagram. So what's been a big break since then? I don't know. I don't know if I've had it yet. And maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> maybe we don't want to ever have the big break. You know, I don't know. Um, I feel like I've had a lot of tiny ones that just kind of built up over time. And then a few things here and there that have gone bigger, like that had on TikTok or other things. I guess for me, like the, the most rewarding thing for me is the people, which maybe sounds cliche, but I did it out of survival mode, you know? And so the fact that there's people who connect with me on that level and they're there to see shore outfits and hot mess and all of that that's great but 
the connection that they get through it, that's what matters to me. So the big moments for me is when you get a message from somebody and they're like, hey, um, like I had a, a, to be specific, I had a woman a few years ago, about a year and a half ago, she sent me a message and she said, I just came out of depression and um, I've gained some weight and I'm not happy with my body and I haven't left the house in a year. And I watched one of your videos and I put together one of your outfits and I went to church for the first time in a year with my family. Makes me emotional, sorry. Um, so thank you for that. That's the kind of stuff that like matters the most to me um, because it's an outfit and it's a brand and it's all fun and it's all that, but at the end of the day, it's, it's really about the people and taking whatever is on the inside and being confident enough to express it in whatever way makes you happy on the outside, which is the whole, it's what I needed and why I wanted to do it in the first place. So that's probably the stuff that matters the most to me and that I would consider my biggest um, blessing, I guess, as far as this goes, or breakout moment is just when I realize that it's landing with the people the way I intended it to. That's amazing that your, um, some might even say that you're changing lives. So that's, that's amazing. So, I mean, it, in that specific person, you changed her life at, le at least well, for that now, moment. So every that's Sunday, I share my church outfit. Amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so content creation, you create a lot of content. Anybody who has taken a chance to look at Kirsten's video, she is putting out a lot of content. I know that takes time, effort. You've got two, two young children. Um, so tell us about your content creation process along the way and maybe even how it's gotten easier since you first started. Um, I guess that's a multi-layer question. So when I started out, I had this plan of like, okay, I have to do this many things a week. This is the way I'm going to do it. And I'm going to batch my content. I'm going to do it all at once. Um, which content batching, if you don't know, you just like take a day and you just do it all at one time and you save all your drafts. And that way throughout the week, you can just kind of put them out, which works really well for certain businesses or avenues and not so well for other things. So like if I'm trying to share my daily outfit, I cannot batch my content is just not doable, you know? Um, so I started out with that in mind. And I also, honestly, at first, had a little bit of analysis paralysis because I didn't fully have my blinders on. And I was really comparing to what everyone else was doing and like how often they were putting stuff out and how they were doing things. And, and I was like, oh, I got to do this. And I got to have a newsletter. And I got to make this many videos. And I got to, you know. And then I kind of realized it's really less about and even, even after talking with Meta and knowing all the algorithms and stuff too, it's less about having a certain, there's not one certain schedule that works for everyone, but more about just being consistent with whatever schedule works for you. So now that I've kind of fallen into that routine, um, typically I do one daily and I just kind of do those when I'm getting ready for the day or when I'm out doing something that I'm wanting to share and it puts less pressure on me. Um, and then I'll just edit it later in the evening. Um, as far as creating content now, I start every month um, with writing down some ideas of things that I might want to share that week. I have a little board above my desk and I just like full of post-it notes. I just put them all on there and then once I do it, I pull it off. If I buy anything new, I write it on a post-it, put it up there. If something pops in my head, I put it there. But I start the month by doing that, just writing down ideas. And I feel like with any content for any business, for anyone that's going to relate with someone, it needs to educate, inspire, entertain, like those three buckets. So I try to fill those three buckets when I'm coming up with my ideas, like a few from each one. And then as things come to me, I, you know, add them. Um, I just, I use my phone. I don't use a fancy camera. I use this little tripod that you see right here. Um, my phone, I do have some box lighting because I film a lot in my house. So I have some stand up like photography box lighting and I just do it all in my phone. I don't, I used to do it in Instagram or TikTok like directly. And I don't because I learned the hard way that sometimes you get a malfunction and it'll delete all your drafts and then everything that you had in there is gone. Um, so I just film it in my phone. I, I use, um, an app called InShot. It's free to edit all my videos. Um, and then I take a picture after I take whatever video I'm going to take so that I have a cover photo. Edit that. I use, I do have Canva Pro so that I can have all my fonts and colors saved for my branding. And I use Canva Pro to make my, like, I have a, 
I create a graphic like around my cover photo so that when you look at my Reels tab, you can actually see what each video is and they're labeled. It's a little easier so you don't have to scroll through a million. Um, do that all in Canva. If I'm making any collages or sales things, et cetera, that's all in Canva as well. Um, and Canva makes it really easy to do that because like I said, if you have the pro version, you can create your whole brand kit and it'll save all your colors. And even if you are using a graphic that someone else has made, you know, like a, as your base, you can actually just copy your colors from your thing and then hold it down and paste it on there and it'll change it to match your brand. So that's, they make it really easy. Um, but yeah, I do it as that. And then I'll write out a caption, link everything on my, I like to know it, my Amazon, whatever it is that it's going on before I post it and then post it. And honestly, for me, a lot of times it just happens like, I just kind of do it in the moment or within the same day. So who is, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. Who is your overall target audience? And I know that you do, you're, you've talked about some, some different brands that you've represented and, and, um, who, and specifically someone who, who was very influenced by your, um, outfit that you shared on a Sunday morning, who, who is, who would you say is your overall target audience? Well, my target audience first and foremost is typically majority female, um, Women in their, you know, 20s to 60s, um, people in general that just need to feel like they aren't alone and have some kind of boost of confidence. Um, also, there's a tall aspect to it. I am 6'1", um, and at first I actually didn't include that in my target audience because I thought, oh, if I talk about that too much, I'm going to deter people who aren't my same height. But we all kind of know now how to look at things and know if they'll fit us the same way, et cetera. And, and it's beneficial to people who are my height. So tall, um, 20s to 60s, females. Um, and I go so far, I don't want to bore you with all of that, but it's kind of fun when you sit down to do your branding and your, like, make your own target audience. I call them, like, an avatar. Like, I have probably, like, three. And if you sit down and you make, like, a little avatar in your head, and you can even name them if you want to get real fun with it, but, like, what age they are, what music they listen to, what's their biggest hurdle in life, um, you know, do they have friends, do they need community, um, how do you help them, where do they shop, what might they like to eat, and so I have those specifically for mine, and then you can kind of access that, too, whenever you're thinking of your content for the week or for the month, you know, when you're trying to figure out what is it that you want to be sharing, well, you look at that and you think, okay, well, let's say I'm talking to this person. What can I share with them, um, you know, this month that's going to help this specific person? And how do you meet them? What music are they listening to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, but my, as far as my target audience is concerned, it's just uh, females, typically, like, majority females, 20 to 60, um, that need to feel like they're not alone, that need a little spark of confidence and want a community, and they just happen to like some fun clothes in the process. <laughs> That's great. Um, who are some influencing influencers that you found uh, maybe early on in your career, and maybe you even still watch and are inspired by other influencers? Who, who are some other ones that you watch? Mm, yeah, I love watching them. Um, so Shelb's Tales, she would be one of my favorites. I watch her. Um, better with Chardonnay. She's so fun, and I admire how real she is. I mean, she is, which I actually shared one like this uh, recently too, but she'll be in her story straight up trimming her nose hair. She does not care, and um, in fact, we just bought that nose hair trimmer, my best friend and I, the other day, and we tried it out on Instagram, so if you want a good laugh. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll just tell all this. It's not a secret. It's on Instagram. Um, yeah, her, um, Fit Babe on a Budget, she's taller, and um, she shares a lot of affordable fashion like Walmart, Target, things that are more accessible um, for my budget and most. Um, but yeah, that's who comes top of mind. How do affiliate link, links work exactly? Okay, so it's kind of like we talked about with TikTok Shop where okay. you get um, a percentage. So... It again, it depends on the brand, but like specifically through Like to Know It, which is what I majority use. Um, Amazon, Amazon's a separate ball game, so they're about 10%, and um, you do have to apply to be in the program where you get your storefront. Um, 
and they pay you out basically through every sale that's generated through your personalized links. Like to know it's the same, um, but they are like a hub for a bunch of other businesses. So, you know, Dillard's, Free People, Walmart, Target, whoever it might be, and they're all on Like to Know It. So the brand themselves is actually paying a small percentage to Like to Know It to be on there and accessible to all the people who are linking it. And then they also pay you a certain percentage for kind of like a personal shopper's fee, I guess, or like a finder's fee. So say I share this outfit, which I'll do later. Um, and you click on the link to this shirt and you go buy it. I would get whatever percentage that brand offers for you purchasing it through my link. Oh, and if you ever want to get into something like this, it's fun also to know, or if you just want to support your friends and family who do it, that it also, like a lot of the brands, their cookies stay open for anywhere from two days to a week. So like Amazon's a week. So this is not from Amazon, but for the sake of this conversation, say you bought this shirt from me on Amazon and then you didn't close your Amazon out and you bought something else two days later. If you were there through my link, I get a commission off whatever else you bought too, which is nice um, as an influencer. So sometimes I'll look at my analytics and I'm like, Okay, we got diabetic socks and a <laughs> thermometer and diapers. And I know I didn't share it, but cool. I'm glad y'all got what you need. <laughs> Interesting. So there's so many different ways that you can um, be paid through being an influencer, um, which, which is fascinating to me. But specifically, can you talk a little bit about TikTok Creator Fund? And do you use that? And if so, how does that work? Because I know that there's some restraints on that. Um, I do. It, mine's honestly kind of messed up right now, um, so I'm not sure what's going on with that, but with the TikTok Creator Fund, you're getting paid for views, so you don't have to make any sales. Um, your videos have to be a minute or more um, in order to qualify, and I do think, and don't quote me, but I do think there is something with how long a person has to stay on it for that view to count. I don't know the exact amount of seconds off the top of my head. Um, and they pay it's p pennies, pennies per views, but it adds up over time. So yeah, uh, with the TikTok creator fund, you get paid just for views and people interacting with your stuff. And then the TikTok shop adds in the, um, say that five times fast, by the way, that's a tongue twister, um, adds in the benefit of being able to make the commission off the actual products. But you could get on there if you're in the TikTok creator fund, you don't have to be selling anything. It could be, you know, like here we are at Discovery Park. If they're posting something and they're a part of the creator fund, they could be getting paid for people viewing their videos. Fascinating. Um, so I'm a TikTok fan. I like, but what's your favorite platform and why? It changes back and forth. I, I use TikTok and Instagram the most. Um, it's hard to say. Honestly, I used to not utilize my TikTok as much. And um, Mr. Scott, who's not here, uh, I was on the podcast in 2022 and he kept saying, and you're on TikTok and you're on TikTok. And I was like, no, yeah, barely, which at that time I was just making videos for fun um, that had nothing to do with any of my like branded content or anything I normally put out. It was just silly stuff with my kids. And then after he kept saying it and kept saying it, I was like, okay, I guess I need to get on TikTok now. Uh, so I did. And so maybe I, yes, yes. So yes, we'll put it on the record. I need to thank Scott for that um, because it really took off after that. Um, I, I have a, I love certain things about different ones. Instagram is really easy in, um, well, it used to be where you could just post photos and you didn't have, if you were having an off day, you didn't have to put your face on there and be talking and whatever, and you could just kind of post, which now it's more real focused, so maybe not so much now. TikTok is nice in the sense that I do feel like it's a little less curated, and so it seems a little more genuine to me and easier to create content specifically, like only for TikTok, because you can get on there and look in a hot mess, and which I kind of do on both. Um, but you can just make it real fast spur of the moment and it does better on TikTok, whereas Instagram, there's a little bit more of a method to the madness. And that's nice in certain ways, but sometimes that's a little more daunting to think about doing. 
We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to hear from our audience. Um, Just as a reminder, we're recording a special episode at our monthly American Advertising West Tennessee chapter. And we have some lovely audience members here who, who are excited to ask questions from Kirsten. And we cannot wait to hear from them when we get back. For many, the Hatchie River is a restorative sanctuary and a place to feel connected to something larger than ourselves. The Hatchie River Conservancy is working to conserve and sustain the river's natural integrity and scenic beauty for generations to come. For more information on how you can help, visit HatchieRiver.org. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America. Please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. This is your host, Claire Somm, and our guest today is Kirsten Blanchard. So I think now I'm going to open it up to get questions from our audience here, unless you have anything you want to add before I open it up for more questions. Okay. How do you create your media kit, and how do you get the collection of information? Um, So Canva is helpful with this as well, because you can actually go on Canva and put in their media kit, and it's going to pop you up a million options that people already have on there and show you what you need on there. Or you can give it a quick Google, and it'll tell you what to include. Um, As far as gathering the information to put on there, in Instagram and TikTok both, you can access your analytics um, in your back office, and it'll tell you, um, like, what percentage of your following is male and female, what their age is. It'll even give you a little bar and show you like you have this percent is this age group, this percentage, this age group. Um, And then you can calculate, um, like on TikTok, you kind of have to do it yourself a little bit with the calculating like how good your um, performance is. But both of them actually have all that data for you in the backside of your settings. You can go and look at it and it'll let you know. And then you just put it in there and make it your colors and send it out on a prayer. Awesome. Planning, recording, content creation, all the things that go into this. How much time does it take? That's a very good question, and I'll probably have to sit down and really think about it specifically because I don't know. I will say because I'm so um, creativity-minded, I guess, it's like always top of mind, and it's kind of second nature to me now. And most of what I'm doing is sharing my everyday life, so it's kind of like an all-the-time thing. Um, As far as creating the actual content, I mean, sometimes I spend a little bit more time. You know, it might take me... 10 minutes to film the video and then 30 minutes to edit it and write the captions out and then you know another 15 minutes to get it all linked and put where it needs to be and then post it and then story it so a couple hours maybe per video um, depending sometimes though like the one on TikTok just threw it up there Um, it's not having to be linked through an outside affiliate thing so that was faster so some takes longer than others I don't have a specific answer Um, I would say at least a few hours a day but it's kind of 24 seven for me almost. I have had to be intentional lately about shutting it off, shutting off the brain, shutting off the creator mind, cutting it out for a minute, like give myself actual like business hours, (laughs) which is hard to do though when you're just sharing your real life and all the, because I share all the things we do. But yeah, I'm gonna think on that. Thank you for asking me that. But yeah, at least a few hours a day, I would say, but definitely not, Well, that's a lie. I was going to say definitely not 40 hours a week like a typical job, but I think that's probably a lie. I think it might be a little more than that if I was really thinking about it. (laughs) Yeah. Compared to when you were a cosmetologist, how that? Yeah. Well, and it it doesn't feel as much like work, if you will. So maybe that's also why I can't pinpoint that. I did use my social media a lot when to touch on what you just said as a cosmetologist as well, Um, because when we moved here, I didn't have a clientele at all. And that's actually when I realized how beneficial it could be, like social media could be for a business because I moved here and I knew no one and now I had to go in a salon and build a clientele and somehow make money and know absolutely nobody at all in this whole area. So I I walked around and handed some business cards like door to door, but that only gets so far. And so I utilized social media at that time to share what I was doing and, you know, hashtag the location and interact with accounts that were similar to my target audience for that and grew to have a full book in a year and a half. And I was like, wow, this social media stuff really helps as far as business is concerned. Um, So I kind of knew from that that, you know, it was 
it could really benefit you in multiple areas. So when I started doing it for this, that kind of gave me a little bit of like a roadmap. Um, so even with being in the salon, I mean, I was using my social media then too. So I was working technically, I guess, outside of salon hours as well. And sometimes we forget we need a highlight until 9 p.m. So. <laughs> Do you have any specific campaigns that you introduce to boost engagement? You mean like paying for them within the social media? No, I haven't really done that a whole lot. Um, I have one time and it did work really well. I just haven't done it again. And I just did a very small one. It was for like a pair of pants that I bought from Walmart um, that I actually thought was going to flop because they were out of stock online. Um, but on Walmart, um, this is a side note, but you can put your zip code in and it'll let you buy it through my link, but pick it up at your store. So that was beneficial. Um, but anyways, I did boost that one because it kind of started going a little bit and then I noticed it plateauing. Um, but it, ha it had the potential to go big because I saw it kind of gaining the momentum. So once it started to plateau, I think I put maybe $5 and boosted it um, for like two days. So I think I paid $10 total and it really took it up a notch. So I do think it could be beneficial. I just don't really utilize it that often. What is one of the biggest obstacles that you faced and how did you navigate it? Definitely the comparison. Um, I think it's really, really easy to fall into that comparison trap and see what everyone else is doing. And it, it's hard to get to the point where you realize there's really no point because everyone's just out here, hopefully, eventually trying to just do it for them, you know, what they need to do for themselves. And if you spend too much time comparison, then you're not moving forward properly. But yeah, the comparison trap, because when you get too focused on that, you, you it's a hindrance to yourself. And I kind of think about it like driving a car. It's human nature to compare and to pay attention to what other people are doing and to see what other people in your industry or business or whatever are doing. And so I think it's kind of silly when people tell you not to compare at all. Um, it's literally impossible. We have side view mirrors on our car for a reason, right? So if you think about it like you're driving, it's, it's, it's beneficial to see who's doing what over here and where they are, as long as you're staying in your own lane and you're still safely moving forward for everyone involved. Um, so learning that though was hard. I was at first probably spending a little too much time looking in the side view mirror and not enough focused on moving forward safely. Um, but you just get to a point where you're like, and hopefully sooner rather than later, is just you. And if you're not showing up just as you, whether that be through your business or yourself or whatever it might be, then the people that are looking for you can't find you. So learning to show up just as me as is and not compare too much probably was the biggest obstacle, especially in the beginning. Has that gotten easier as time goes on now that you're a seasoned influencer? <laughs> I wouldn't say that I'm seasoned, but it's definitely gotten easier because it's a mindset shift. Um, at this point, it's really, it's draining to operate out of that place of comparison and to um, not knowing like if you should be doing something a certain way or will people like a certain thing. And I think with, with age, with business, with content creation, with literally everything, we get to a point where you're like, so what? Like, it, it doesn't matter if they don't like it, they don't like it, you know? Um, but it's draining to, to operate from that. So I do think it's gotten a lot easier now. I am not only, um, I guess, more confident in myself and just being just who I am, but also reading the analytics and the things that my followers and more comfortable with knowing what they like, what they respond to. Um, now I feel like I kind of just know, you know, how things are going to land, how people are going to receive things. Um, and yeah, I think if you do it from a place of joy and kindness and what's serving others, then it just kind of comes naturally once you put the blinders on a little bit. I think that's a benefit of in why it's become more popular in today's world. It's because there are no rules. You, you truly can make it what you want to make it. So Zach is asking this question because he recently had a video go viral on Discovery Park's TikTok. So how quickly after you have a video go viral do you need to get another piece of content out there in the world? I would think quickly. I don't think that it, um, on one hand, I don't know if it matters to a certain extent because I do think sometimes it's hit or miss with how that algorithm works. One thing might go really viral and then the next. 
I do think, like, if people are asking questions or commenting on or having things to say about the video that's going viral, it is really beneficial to do, like, response videos because then it's also leading them back to that original one. And when they're on the original one that's going viral and they can see all your responses in the comments. So it kind of leads them to those as well. Um, so I think that's beneficial. Um, but yeah, I think kind of sooner rather than later in my opinion, but I would have to, I don't know the specifics of how their algorithm works to say for sure. Um, if it's related to what you were talking about. If it's not related to what you were talking about, then it may not matter because it might just not land the exact same way. Um, but once you have that video going, people, more people are coming to your page. So even if it's not related, if it is related to what you're normally sharing in your niche and it's consistent to you know, what you would typically be putting out there, it's beneficial to have it there anyways, because even if it doesn't garner the traction at the beginning, they're gonna see it because they're coming to your page and then it's gonna ultimately get more views anyways. And they wanna see what else you're about. Like videos go viral all the time. And sometimes it's like a one-off. Somebody told a joke or they did something and it's just one funny thing. But if you go to their page, there's nothing else like that. So if it's a benefit of something going viral, that's like the stuff that you would normally share anyways and that one just happened to do better than the rest then yeah put put that stuff right out there because you want it there when they come over and they can see oh hey they have a lot of other stuff that's very similar to this or in the same realm of and i actually want to be here and then they follow you and they see your stuff more how do you deal with neg negative pushback from your followers or maybe people who aren't even followers who are just happen to be popping by yeah that's typically the ones, the ones that aren't the followers or that speak to you through their pets account so you don't even know who they are. Um, <laughs> um, typically, so I kind of have a thick skin to begin with and I think it's a blessing and a curse to go through mental health struggles, but I was at a real extreme low. So once I was trying to come out of it and started all of this, like. I kind of was in a headspace of like, I'm doing this for me and, and you can't say anything to me that's going to deter me because I know who I am and I've survived through myself to get to this point, right? So because of that, I had a really thick skin. So a lot of it just rolls off my shoulder. Silly little comments, you know, about, oh, your makeup looks terrible. What? Okay, thank you. I just ignore them. You know, I don't even respond to them or give them any energy. Um, occasionally it is hard though because I'm human. So I mean, things get to you sometimes like and people can be cruel um i recently did have kind of a scary one um where someone was actually threatening my family so that's a whole nother ball game um but thankfully that was just a one one time thing i haven't had to deal with that any other um time and the rest of it is just little you can tell that someone just needed to say something to say something and honestly i just try to lead with grace and kindness, and sometimes the kindest thing you can do is ignore someone when they're being ugly, as my mama would put it. And yeah, I just try to ignore it. Um, but I've been really lucky and I don't get a lot of that. Um, I think it's what you put out too. I also don't really put out anything, in my opinion, that's very polarizing by any means. Um, so yeah, just try to ignore and move forward. It gets to you sometimes, but as long as you have a community not only on there but outside of social media as well that you can go to and vent to about that stuff and talk to them and you kind of just humbly know who you are as a person and what you have to offer the world then those people can't deter you from that do you believe that hashtags work yes um so sometimes i do think you get kind of like lost in a hashtag because if it's too broad or too viral or too big you're not really going to show up under it anyways um it does though in my opinion, help push you to people who are liking similar things, who are watching other things with that hashtag, and therefore you might show up on their feed more often because they're watching a video that says hashtag museum and your video says hashtag museum, so they suggest it to those people. I think it's beneficial in that way. I do also think it's beneficial like locationally for depending on your business or what you're trying to do. Like when I, like I talked about with the salon and trying to build my clientele, that was beneficial to me then, um, hashtagging things in the area so that the people in my area we're getting my content pushed to them. Uh, I think if you do too many, they push you down in the algorithm um, because you seem like a bot. 
I'd say sweet spot's probably like five to 10, in my opinion. And you want to do a few that are more broad and then a few that are really specific to whatever you're talking about. There are some folks here wondering if you've posted <laughs> about your current accessories and your nail polish and your lipstick that you're wearing right now. I haven't, but it'll be on there later today. Okay, yeah. Uh, nail polish, I couldn't tell you. I just picked a random number. I had analysis paralysis, and I was like, um, hot pink. And the lady was like, how about this one? And I was like, perfect. <laughs> Lipstick's old, so don't hate me. That might not be on there. I'll try. I'll try, and I'll try to find you one similar if I can't find this one. I've never heard of analysis paralysis until today. Has anybody, anybody else said that? But you know what? But you get it, right? It's, yeah, you you oh, think about things that. so hard that you just become, like, stagnant. I get that way with cleaning my house. I'm like, wow, there's so many things to do, and suddenly I've sat here for an hour and nothing's happened. Yeah. yeah my brain spins in a circle a lot. That's what I'm going to start calling it. Yeah, and con creating content. You're like, oh, there's all, that's where the post-it notes come in handy for me because when I enter that stage of, we'll say it one more time, analysis, paralysis, <laughs> uh, I can go access those notes and it kind of jogs my brain back to where it needs to go. I think I have maybe adult onset ADHD as well, so that might be part of it. <laughs> Your brain's got to circle back around, yeah. I love it. Okay, <laughs> awesome. So do you ever experience creator burnout and where do you turn to to get new ideas? Absolutely, I do. Um, recently, I've literally just started really working on giving myself grace as far as that um, the content schedule is. Um, I can't, words are hard right now, apparently. But like I was saying, that you don't have to do it a certain way. You can kind of do whatever works for you. I had in my mind before that I had to do it a certain way. And when I was that way, I got a lot of burnout because I was forcing myself to meet a certain deadline. Um, now, if I just give myself some grace, like, okay, we didn't, we didn't do it today, but it's all right, girl, do it tomorrow. Um, I don't get as burnt out because there's not as much like pressure and I still enjoy it. Um, as far as accessing the ideas, I would say like the post-its are helpful. Anytime something pops in, in my head and that might look like a note in your phone or in a notebook or whatever for you. Um, but then you have that there to access. So when I am having burnout and I'm like, I want to put something out, but I don't know what to do. I can look at that and it'll kind of spark some creativity um but yeah maybe just go into a schedule that works for me um is helpful um and like you said analysis paralysis not doing it like everyone else but just how it works for you and you'll kind of find like what feels the least amount of stressful was there a second part to your question that i didn't answer okay thank you yeah do you take it with you everywhere does your does your followers go with you everywhere like vacation or do you yeah yeah they do I uh well, I mean even I told you we trimmed our nose hairs in the bathroom the other day at my best friend's house they were there for that too um I had that that incident with the um like cyber troll was somewhat recently so I did have about two weeks period of time that I just kind of had to step back away from social media for a minute and just to give myself like a reboot of like okay <laughs> don't be afraid and also everybody's not a big meanie um you're okay go back out there and and i got kind of out of the habit of it but i feel like it's like a well well seasoned that's not the word i'm looking for but like a muscle you use all the time once you get in the habit of sharing it all and taking them with you everywhere it does really just become a habit so like my kids and husband are used to it now too you just you know and because we're sharing real life you can just talk when everyone else is talking or doing crazy stuff anyways and it's not out of the norm because but even with like businesses and things i feel like once you or like with the hair once you do it more often it just becomes second nature and so yeah they go i take my followers everywhere i mean not to the bathroom but <laughs> some do <laughs> yeah only yeah. for the nose hairs <laughs> yeah. Does else have oh problem? gosh <laughs> Not me talking yeah, about nose hairs on a podcast. <laughs> I do not have a question, but I do want to share my immense appreciation for you just sharing that. You started out your social media journey doing it for yourself, and I just started a bookstagram. <gasps> just started like, oh. just started. and I've been wanting to do it for like a year. And I think that I felt so much pressure of it becoming like viral, where people will visit my page to get book recommendations, but. The more I think about it, the more I just want to do it for myself because I can look back and it's like a book journaling mm -hmm. journey, essentially. Yeah. So I really appreciate you for starting.
starting off with that and saying that that's how your journey began because I relate a lot more to that than the desire to become viral or right. just an information host. I appreciate that. So dependent on who's finding it right so if you're doing it for you then the people who need you are gonna find you because that's how you're showing up and if you're doing it for everyone else then you lose you and then the people who need who you actually are don't know where you at right so I think that's kind of important anyways to do it for yourself or you know even as business is concerned everyone has a reason they got into or started the business that they're in they have a passion about it, they have what, and maybe only one person sees that, but if one person sees it, then it's better than before. And if it only helps you, then good, it helps you. So yeah, I, I think that's really important. Also, I need you to tell me this bookstagram so I can follow it because I am an avid reader. So I wanna, I wanna follow you too. But thank you for saying that. Yeah, I feel like it's beneficial to, to know why you're doing something and to find the joy in it and to have the purpose in doing it and just by nature, you know, if you're showing up that way and you're putting it out there in that way, then the people will come and they will be your people. I think that's a perfect way to wrap up <laughs> this episode of Real Foot Forward. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Do you have anything else you want to add before we go? Hmm. No, maybe just like an addendum to or add on to what we just said. It's just I would encourage everybody, whether it be business or yourself, to just show up as who you are. You know, uh, people need who you are, and we all have something so unique to offer. And it might not even be in the same realm of what you do, but you can connect to someone as a person on that level. And so just show up as yourself and don't be afraid to do so because you have a voice and you have a purpose. And it was given to you for a reason. No one else can use it, so don't be afraid to. Will you tell us where we can find you on your social media platforms? Yes. Okay, so Instagram, it's Kirsten R. Blanchard, um, middle initials in there. And on TikTok, it's just Kirsten Blanchard. And then I'm on threads, but that kind of goes through Instagram. Um, like to know it, and I have a like to know it in an Amazon storefront as well, and those are both just my first and last name. Thanks to all of you listeners who have joined us today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.